today in lots of different forms uh, it shows up. It shows up in some, some of our literature, it shows in some of our novels, it shows up in a lot of movies. Uh, much as I love Star Wars, there's something about, the, so something about uh, the uh, theology of the Force being with you and everything else. That's, uh, there's, there's, it's, never mind, it runs all over the place. So, we can have fun with it and play with it, but know where we stand and know where our grounding is and know what the truth is. I think that's important. With this one, last time we were looking at one branch of Gnosticism that was pretty far out there, pretty wild. We can see how it would develop from Jewish circles uh, frustrated with the problem of evil in the world and trying to make sense out of it and reinterpreting Genesis especially to tell a different kind of story that made sense to them in a different way. Um, with, uh, with this form of Gnosticism we're going to look at today, Valentinian Gnosticism, it gets a little more difficult to handle because it moves more securely into the church. Sethian Gnostics stood apart from the church and took pot shots at the church. Um, Valentinian Gnostics were within the church. Um, so uh, uh, on the sheet there, the second, second group of bullets, Valentinian Christians, they were thoroughly involved in the life of the church. They thought of themselves simply as devoted Christians, a kind of a spiritual elite within the congregation. They studied the writings of Paul and John. They produced their own letters, commentaries, and sermons. They convened their own meetings in addition to regular church services. So they'd be part of the regular church services, and then they'd have their own special meetings on the side with just their own group. They claimed a deeper knowledge and a more mystical form of piety, and they added their own higher mysteries to the churches that should be church apostrophe S, not church ES, to the church's sacraments. Um, so we saw in, um, when we looked at the Gospel of Philip before, we saw that he had five sacraments, the ones that we know, plus several on beyond that, that took, him, took them higher and deeper. Now let's just, just have you stop and think about that for a moment. Imagine that there is here at Bethlehem uh, a group of people who are deeply spiritual, who are thoroughly integrated into the life of the congregation, and they worship with us, and they teach with us, and they serve with us, but then they also meet separately, just this group, for their own um, spiritual, spiritual depth meetings of some kind. And when you get a chance to talk to them, they, they say, no, we're Christians like everybody else, we just have... The Lord has brought us to understand these things more deeply. What would you think about a group like that? What would you do with it? What would you do if you were the pastor of Bethlehem? Well, how, how, did, they, how did they determine that they were part of the elite group? Or how would, 
can be accepted into that elite. Yeah. How would they determine that they were part of the elite, or how would you be accepted into the elite group? How, what do you think, from what you've seen of Gnosticism so far? How would you come to that conclusion? I think you'd have to be invited. You'd have to be invited. Okay. Yeah, so if there were someone already in that group who saw who saw in you a certain spiritual sensitivity, thought, oh, there's somebody who might be right for going deeper. And they might invite you. Come to our come to our meeting. And um, you know, would it be would it be anything different from our uh, summertime Practicing the presence <laughs> group. <laughs> well, it just could be Bible study. They study Paul and John, so could be Bible study. Could Come to the Bible study. Bible study group. Sure. Start with it. Yeah. Yeah. There are, in fact, groups <laughs> like this in a lot of churches, um, and it's difficult to to know what to do with a group like that because. If they agree with all of our Christian teaching, um, how do you how do you challenge someone else's claim to deeper insight? What the church did do was it would draw up creeds um, and confessions and teachings and standards of our faith, and that we would hold together as where we stand. Um, and after a while, they had to make those more specific in a way that sort of that would undercut the teachings of these groups. So, in fact, our Nicene Creed uh, does does some of that work. It undercuts some of these teachings intentionally. But what do you do when it's just? I think a lot of churches faced this with the charismatic movement back in the 60s and 70s. So here's a group that suddenly, a group of people that are uh, fired up for Christ fired up by the power of the Holy Spirit. They have scriptures that they can that they can focus on. How and there's there you want to be able to celebrate it. But I, I don't want to stop the work of the Holy Spirit. I don't want to quench what God might be doing. Um, and yet if that group begins to kind of separate itself off in a, with a mentality that says we're kind of the next step up. That that really destroys the fabric of Christian faith. It's a, it's a difficult puzzle. Well, Valentinus, uh, the guy after whom this, this, um, this movement is named, he was an Af now we're at the top of the page, an African church leader born in Egypt in the early 2nd century. Uh, so this is not all that long after Christ and the Apostles. Educated in these great Hellenistic schools in Alexandria, he appears to be familiar with the philosophy of Plato uh, through its Neoplatonic forms. Uh, with the teachings of the Jewish thinker Philo of Alexandria, with the, of the teachings of the Gnostic Christian facilities, and he perhaps is familiar with the Gospel of Thomas, which we have yet to look at. But, but he's so steeped in Christian things and marginally Christian things and um, philosophical matters. Um, he, this, piece, this piece is interesting to me. While the churches, while the Orthodox Church, more and more claimed a line of authority coming down from the apostles and the apostolic succession. Um, so that's, that's one of the ways to help guarantee the teaching is to pass it on down from one leader to another. Uh, some of these Valentinus had, had a similar claim. He claimed that the apostle Paul had taught his secret teachings to a man named Thutis, who then taught them to uh, Valentinus. So he's got his own um, apostolic succession of secret teachings. Let's say match them claim for claim. Um, he moved to Rome in the early mid-century and became a leader there in the Roman Orthodox Church. And he was even at one point considered for Bishop of Rome. He might have become what we later know as Pope. He might have become uh, the leader of the Church of Rome, but he lost the election to somebody else. But he was that well thought of in the community that he was put up for a candidate for Bishop of Rome. So this is not somebody way out there uh, with a sect off on the side. This is someone right in the heart of the church, which made it more all the more difficult to get a handle on what is this thing going on here. Okay. A couple of uh, 
scriptures as we move into this. There is language in the New Testament that can give some steam to these kind of things. Um, when we were in the, in the same-sex conversations that we were having on Thursdays, we looked at Romans 1. Um, in Romans 1, Paul's talking about what's happened out there in the Gentile world. Uh, Romans 1, 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. Um, Verse 21, though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to, become, to be wise, they became fools. Uh, we do have that language in the New Testament of human thinking becoming darkened, and we don't know the truth anymore. Uh, that's right there in the gospel, right there in, in, in Romans. So it's there to pick up on. It's one of the ways you can talk about the human problem and what Christ comes to do. Here's another one. Would you look please at 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 2. In 1 Corinthians 1, Paul is contrasting the cross, the wisdom of the cross, the foolishness of the cross with human wisdom. Corinth is in Greece. It's a, it's a culture that loves wisdom and goes after wisdom, prizes wisdom, and Paul is, is fighting with that. He talks about the wisdom of this world and how the foolishness of the cross undercuts the world's wisdom. That's the second half of 1 Corinthians 1. Um, you move into, into chapter 2, and Paul says, I came preaching Christ crucified, not in lofty words of wisdom, but in demonstration of God's power. But then look at verse 6. Can somebody read for us, please? 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 10. Please. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom. Although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glorification. <coughs> None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. <coughs> what are you hearing? Secrets. Secret wisdom. <coughs> the foolishness of the cross undercuts all human wisdom, but there is a secret wisdom that we share together uh, among the mature. You beginners, no, you don't get it yet. But among the mature, there is a secret wisdom that we share. This stuff's right there in Paul. It wouldn't have been very difficult for someone like Valentinus to read Paul and say, there it is. Right there. In fact, he goes on. Um, we've, we've talked about, and we'll see again, how Gnostics like to do this kind of triage. There are three kinds of people. There are spirit people, and there are soulish people, who there's some hope for them. And then there are the material, wooden people that really there's, don't waste your time. You're not going to make it. Okay. Um, here is verse verse 13 of the same chapter. We speak of these things in words not well, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual things to those who are spiritual. Those who are unspiritual, and the word that he uses there in 14 is um, soulish. Those who are the middle group, those who are soulish do not receive the gifts of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to them. They're unable to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. Those who are spiritual discern all things, and they themselves are subject to no one's scrutiny. Scrutiny. Um, Paul's just kind of setting this up. <coughs> yes, among the mature among us, there is this 
special wisdom, this secret wisdom that we have. And these poor, these poor Corinthians who come from a culture that absolutely love wisdom and secrets, they're just salivating by the time you <laughs> bring it on. Yeah. Chapter 3, so brothers and sisters, I could, not, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as flesh people, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food. You weren't ready for solid food. Even now you're still not ready, for you're still flesh people. As long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not just flesh people behaving according to human inclinations? He's gone back to where he started with this community dividing into factions. He uses the very language of spiritual triage to say, um, sorry folks, you're not even soulish people, you're just flesh people. <laughs> He's playing games with their poor little minds. I love it. Okay. And when you do press Paul on, because he means that there is a, a hidden wisdom. Paul, what is this hidden wisdom? It's The hidden wisdom is God's plan in Christ from the beginning of time that was hidden and now is revealed and wide open for gathering up all of humanity into Christ. That's the hidden wisdom. And so they'll keep on circling right back to the cross and to Christ when you finally press them on what's the wisdom you're talking about. It's a little crazy making and it's very fun. Okay. Thoughts, questions, comments? When, when, when Christ says you, you have to be like a little child to enter the kingdom of God, he wipes all this out. Kind of does, doesn't it? <laughs> Entering like a child. And I rest on that. <laughs> Smart man. It seems when, when people or groups start to talk of special knowledge and secrets, it imparts a sense of elitism and I'm better yes. than you. Absolutely. And Jesus himself speaks about those who want to be first or are going to be last. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't know the Bible well enough, but I'm sure he has some other things to say about people who think they're above everybody else. Yeah. So, even if it says this, when Paul writes this in Corinthians, talking about his special knowledge, maybe the Corinthians thought that was cool, but I don't think that's very cool. It's yeah. special, you're better than me. That's right. And I've, I've run into people in, in the church we used to belong to years ago, but then... They thought they knew more, they had special knowledge, but they were willing to share it, so they didn't come across as totally elitist. Right. They did have a little bit of piety, I guess, but not what it says here. The <coughs> Gnostics don't seem to be that way. No. So one of the questions in, in all this is, was Gnosticism already flourishing by this time when Paul writes? The full-blown Gnostic systems don't seem to have existed quite yet, but I'm more and more convinced that the, the attitudes and the kind of basic themes that are part of Gnostic thinking had to already have been there. Be, for, for example, what we just read there in 1 Corinthians, with Paul using the very language of dividing up humanity into these different groups. Um, that's already there, uh, so the, and, the, and the fascination with secret wisdom is already there. So then when you watch, watch what Paul does in broad strokes, it gets all the more fun. Um, in 2 Corinthians, the last four chapters of 2 Corinthians are just this marvelous, crazy argument. People have come into, some of these wisdom teachers have moved into Corinth after Paul was there, and they're teaching their secret wisdom and their special stuff. He calls them the super apostles. Um, and so he says, okay, this is a stupid game, but you forced me to play it. So I'm going to match you boast for boast. And it's this crazy four chapter long argument where he matches the super apostles boast for boast. And when it finally gets to the climax of it, it's one of the, the best parts in, in 2 Corinthians 12, he says, okay, let's move on to visions and revelations since you guys are claiming all these special visions that you've got. Well, I know of a guy 14 years ago, he has to go back 14 years to find one, but I know of a guy 14 years ago who was caught up to the, caught up to paradise, caught up to the third heaven, and saw things that, oh, I'm sorry, he's not allowed to tell you what he heard, 
there, their secrets. Um, he's playing right into all this stuff. Well, he had, he's talking about himself. He had some kind of ecstatic experience, caught up to the third heaven, and things were revealed to him. And then he says, and to keep me from being too puffed up by all of these revelations, God gave me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me. And I kept on pleading with God to take it away, and God said, no, my grace is enough for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. So I'm going to boast of my weaknesses, not my visions. He just plays their game of all of the special stuff that we get, and then he just turns the whole thing upside down and says, no, we belong to the one who went to the cross. That's what this is all about. It's just fascinating, fun argument. I think. Did he talk so much in riddles that they didn't even get it? I don't know if they got it or not. I mean, it almost sounds like a lot of these agnostics and, and some of these other people that, I mean, looking back now and what you're saying and stuff, it's pretty obvious what, what he was doing. But for a lot of these letters, yeah. I think went right over the top of the heads from how much people find and stuff. I think you're right. We, we, we read and hear selectively. And so the very fact that, now, and I have to grant at the same time that Paul has a mystical strain in him. I don't think there's any question about that. Paul has, has mystical experiences and wonderful, amazing things happening in his life. And that's tantalizing. And it's not gonna, we're not going to somehow dismiss that and say, nah, he didn't, those things weren't true. Um, but for um, Valentinus, you know, Sasenja, decades later, or close to a century later, to be studying Paul's writings, he's clearly picking out pieces that he likes from Paul and he can run with. And he has to ignore the other parts. He has to ignore what Paul actually does with them or where he goes with them. But that's kind of what we all do. We can choose what we want. So is the issue here the secretism and the elitism um, and the selective <clears throat> choosing? Uh, if, if we're talking about mysticism and Paul, then how do you uh, how do you balance that? Isn't that kind of a secret knowledge? There is secret knowledge, but what Paul does with what Paul does with the secrets is he says, this was kept secret in God's wisdom until Christ came, and now it's wide open. So in Paul, the, the mystery is blown wide open and proclaimed. Um, so even though he certainly has experiences, they, they all feed the wide open gospel that he has. Now, I think the issue is, part, part of the issue is the 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 draw of secrecy that does lead to an elitism that kind of automatically goes there and then in addition to that is the question of what is our human situation what's our what is our human predicament um, how do we describe it what is our need um, and Gnosticism basically wants to say that our need is that we don't know who we are um, we're ignorant and if, when we once discover who we are, then we can progress. Then we can, then we can move toward, back toward God again. And Jesus' role then is simply to come and tell us who we are. He's the revealer. We don't really need a savior. We need someone to tell us the truth. Is this idea of the, the secrets and things kind of where the Lutherans have come from on organizations that have secrets? I suspect that plays in uh, with the battles of, over, over the centuries with, with secret societies. Uh, there is also a power, there's, a, there's a, also been a power struggle going on with that. And in addition, a different way of salvation. Um, so when, when uh, the, Masonic, the Masonic order um, Nowadays, I don't, 
I think what's left of the Masonic Order now is, is mostly just a service organization and a club. I don't know if anybody really takes its origin seriously anymore. But there was a day when its, when its teaching um, was really a, a counter-religion. Um, it would take the, um, the rituals and everything that were supposed to be kept secret but got leaked out anyway. Um, they would take biblical texts and drop out the name of Christ um, and reshape it um, into basically a different, an alternative religion. Who, who all took it seriously that way? I don't know. But for a while, it was seen by Lutherans and, and other denominations as a counter-religion. That's uh, why my dad didn't last in his first parish. He tried to fight that and lost. <laughs> Are there maybe elements of this spiritual elitism, if you will, in uh, modern day churches where you know, people are speaking tongues and things like that? I mean, do they, or is that kind of different? I, I think the, for, with the charismatic movement <coughs> in the churches, I think that danger is always there. So I, I, was, I was part of the, of the charismatic movement in college, particularly. Um, and found it to be pretty exciting and powerful and invigorating for my faith. Uh, it really built a, a, a community that was vibrant and, and good. But we found ourselves having to struggle with Pentecostal teaching that in effect set up, you know, the, the more Pentecostal the charismatic movement gets, the more it sets up a two-stage Christianity. You've got ordinary schlucks out there ordinary believers, and then you've got the spirit filled, which is um, more and more I'm convinced is not biblical. But there are charismatic groups, particularly in the Catholic Church, they've done it well, uh, better than anybody else, where the Catholic charismatic movement has, uh, has really been seen, it, been seen as a renewal movement, a renewal of the spirit, and is less, uh, less prone to elitism. Um, so some figured out how to do it, and some didn't. But there is that elitism in some of these um, churches where they really think they're the only ones that are going to heaven except the county. That's right. And there'll be a few other people, but... When in fact we know that we're the only ones. <laughs> <laughs> For those jokes where you get to heaven and find this little group of Lutherans hidden off someplace and say, don't bother them, they think they're the only ones here. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll look a little bit at the, as we, as we move into the Valentinian school of Gnosticism, it's less blatant than the, the Nicephian stuff was. But that also means it's, it's more, it makes it more difficult to say, well, where's the line between truth and distortion? Um, uh, so the rest, of, the rest of page one there, um, some, of the, some of the details of Valentinian teaching. Um, Sophia, wisdom, falls as she does in Sethian versions. Um, but it's a less drastic kind of, kind of thing. Uh, point four, the creator, the demiurge, is ignorant, but he's not this evil beast that he was, the Yaldaba Oath was in Sethian Gnosticism. So the creation of matter and the world is still negative. It's like this is uh, Gnosticism soft or something like that. Um, point six at the bottom of the page the cross is important for Valentinian Gnostics, but it's interpreted metaphorically as a source of life and a revelation of incorruptibility. So if on the cross, uh, Jesus can let go of his material being and be set free to be the spiritual being that he is, then the cross can become for all of us um, a, 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 a declaration of our spiritual freedom. But it's interesting that so comes into this Believe too. I mean, is it the same same way that she was created? Pretty much. So, so Sophia or wisdom is again like in Sethian Gnosticism. She's one of the waves of godness that comes off from the one and is down the chain far enough that she blunders and 
but it was pretty similar to Sethian Gnosticism, but not as evil. More just, oops, I made a mistake. Okay. Um, let's drop down to, on page two, the Gospel of Truth. This is a pretty early one. It's second century, middle of second century, and it may be the, that Valentinus himself wrote this one. Many people think he wrote, he wrote it. Um, third bullet, it presupposes Gnostic myth, but doesn't lay out all those details. It focuses on, quote, the truth that brings redemption to an anguished humanity, languishing in darkness and ignorance. And it focuses on the one who brought this revealed truth. So, next bullet, here are the opening words of the Gospel of Truth. So listen for what, uh, how much of this sounds like what you would want a Christian sermon to say. And if there's anything in this paragraph that makes you uncomfortable. Okay? The Gospel of Truth is joy for those who have received from the Father of Truth the grace of knowing him through the power of the word that came forth from the pleroma, the fullness, the one who is in the thought and mind of the Father, that is, the one who is addressed as the Savior, that being the name of the work he is to perform for the redemption of those who are ignorant of the Father, while in the name of the Gospel is the proclamation of hope, being discovery for those who search for him. What do you like? What are you uncomfortable with? Jesus. Oh, well. Yeah. That works a little better. Yeah. yeah, the one who, Jesus, the one who is in the thought and mind of the Father. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Yeah. You can make it work as Christian. That next line, that being the name of the work is performed. Yeah, so he's called Savior, but is there really any saving to do? That's the name of the work he's to perform. It's, just, it's starting to feel just a little slippery. Mm -hmm. Does he mean he is the Savior, or is this just a name that he's gotten? Okay. And there's, you can see right after that the name, a, a naming of the human problem. We're ignorant of the Father. We don't know God. That's true. It's not the whole truth, but it's true. I'm caught by the last line of the paragraph. The proclamation of hope, which is discovery for those who search for him. What is our hope? That we search for God and discover God. Well, we do search for God, don't we? But is that our hope? Discovering the one we search for? That will be saved. It will be saved. There is an issue of uh, what's the direction of action going on here? Who's doing what? And where, what is the ground of our hope? But as you as you read it, it's it's similar enough to what we would say that it's well. That sounds pretty right, sort of. Or is it? <laughs> if we believe that's that's mm -hmm. basically all we need to do. We don't need to go searching and whatever that means. But yeah. And yet we talk that language, we search for God. We, well, the, 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 the evangelism campaign back in the 1970s or so, I found it. And the Lutherans kept wanting to say, well, actually, he found you first. But, yeah. <laughs> well, there's the seek and ye shall find. That's right. That's what Jesus himself, seek and ye shall find. 
there is a seeking that's appropriate. Yeah, and that's what makes this, all the way through, you're starting to have to ask, what do you mean? What? I kind of like those words. What are you saying? For me, the turn right there is the, uh, pro the proclamation of hope being discovery for those who search for him. He's give, starting to give his hand there, I think, at that point. Next paragraph. When the totality, that is, the whole of Godness, went about searching for the one for whom, from, whom, from whom they had come forth. So here is all of the emanations from God, including all the bits of God that are in every one of us, searching for the one that we came from. Okay? Uh, and the totality was inside of him, the inside of the one, the incomprehensible, inconceivable one who is superior to every thought. Ignorance of the Father brought about <coughs> anguish and terror. But here's kind of the origin of evil. Ignorance of the Father produced anguish and terror, and the anguish grew solid like a fog so that no one was able to see. For this reason, error became powerful, it worked on, and it worked on its own matter foolishly, not having known the truth. It set about with a creation, preparing with power and beauty the substitute for truth. Do you hear what just... If, if you knew the Sethian Gnosticism from last week, do you hear what this one's saying? This isn't Yaldabaoth, this kind of monster, stupid god. Um, what is it? Ignorance. Ignorance of the Father. Ignorance of the Father produces anguish. Anguish grows solid like a fog. Error becomes powerful. It works on its own matter and sets about with the creation. So the creation of the world and of matter um, is a kind of a thickening of anguished ignorance. It's not evil, it's just thick, foggy, dumb. <laughs> How is this going to go from, from excessive humanism or, or our sense that you know, we really are in charge? <clears throat> Say more. Well, <clears throat> if you believe that <clears throat> that um, you are a part of God's universe, or if you feel like you're predominantly here and now, and this is a scientific world, and we know how to do this and do that, and pretty soon we'll know enough that we can control this and control that. Um, we get to the point where we are so uh, immersed in human power that, you know, I can see this yeah. explain, being an explanation of that same issue. Sure. And it's plausible. It really, it really, there is, there's stuff about it that makes sense. The unfortunate part of it is that it relegates, it's less obvious in this form than it was in Sethian Gnosticism, but it relegates matter and the creation to a mistake. That's right. Yeah. To a mistake. Creation is an error. <laughs> yeah. The other part of our prayer is asking for protection against human beings making decisions that harm, that you can ask God to protect you from the evil and the anguish around you that can harm you. Mm -hmm. And that is sometimes, you, you know it immediately when you've been protected and it gives you such a wonderful sense that God is with you all of the time. That would fit here. It seems to me that what we hear is that our main problem is ignorance and not rebellion. Yes. And the Jew would not be very susceptible to this because there's the belief that the Torah the law has already revealed a great deal of God. It's the old problem, it's not what I don't know about God that troubles me, it's what I know and I don't follow. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
there isn't much culpability for being ignorant, but there's a great deal of culpability for being in rebellion. Yeah. And when you get the Gospel of John, some some New Testament writings where Jesus is the revealer, you know, how long have you known me, Philip, and you do not yet see the Father? Um, so there are elements in the New Testament that are very Hellenistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know where I'm going with this. But. Yeah. It is. Um, I think it's interesting that it does appear that, that a lot of key Gnostic thought arises exactly from Jewish circles. Um, and it's, it's uh, rebelling against the, that very message of Torah and everything else. It's like we've now come to the conclusion that it's this stupid subordinate God who created all this and is trying to keep us enslaved. So there actually is a, a rebellion within that, but it's a positive, in their own mind, it's a positive rebellion of breaking free from the trammels of this subordinate God. <laughs> Now, part of, what, part of what Joe is lifting up is all of the different ways of describing the human problem. And ignorance is part of it. Um, so is human rebellion. So is a base, uh, somehow a basic uh, turned inwardness of ourselves. Um, we can talk about it. So we, and, and, some, and, and in some measure, the problem is that we are in bondage to powers that are outside us. We can talk about our problem in several different ways. Um, to, to limit it to ignorance is, gets us off the hook. This wasn't my fault. This wasn't my problem. Okay. Jesus' ministry. Um, next bullet down. Through this, the gospel of the one who is searched for, which was revealed to those who are perfect, through the mercies of the Father, the hidden mystery, Jesus the Christ, Enlightened those who were in darkness through oblivion. He enlightened them, he showed them a way, and the way is the truth which he taught to them. Are you hearing a particular verse of scripture there? <coughs> I am the way, the truth, and the life. Except it's I teach the way and the truth and the life. Just a little different. Uh, next page, for this reason, anger, uh, error, pardon me, grew angry at him, persecuted him, was distressed at him, and was brought to naught. He was nailed to a tree, and he became fruit of the knowledge of the Father. That's kind of sweet, actually. Jesus is nailed to a tree, and he becomes the fruit. I like it. Um, it did not, however, cause destruction because it was eaten, this fruit. But to those who ate it, it gave cause to become glad in the discovery. And he discovered them in himself, and they discovered him in themselves. So eating of the, tr eating of the tree that is the cross, eating that fruit, shows you that Jesus is part of you and you are part of Jesus. Okay. Jesus' death. After all these, there, there came, this, this is an interesting paragraph because it's going to talk about this book, and the book is not a book. We've got to figure out what this book is. Okay? After all these things, there came the little children also, those to whom the knowledge of the Father belongs. Having been strengthened, they learned about the impressions of the Father. They knew, they were known, they were glorified, they glorified. There was manifested in their heart the living book of the living the one written in the thought and mind of the Father, which from before the foundation of the totality was within his incomprehensibility, that book which no one was able to take, since it remains for the one who will take it to be slain. Let's pause there for a minute. Are you making any sense of this yet? What is this book? Are there some echoes of Revelation? Some echoes of Revelation, the book, the Lamb's Book of Life, those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life from before the foundation of the world. Okay. Now, the living book of the living, the one written in the thought and the mind of the Father. The thought and the mind of the Father is Jesus. That book which no one was able to pick up and read, since it remains for the one who will take it, to be slain. 
Jesus only could read it, and he needed to be slain first before anybody else could read it. No one could have become manifest from among those who have believed in salvation unless that book had appeared. For this reason, the merciful one, the faithful one, Jesus, was patient in accepting sufferings until he took that book, since he knows that his death is life for many. For this reason, Jesus appeared. He put on that book. He was nailed to a tree. He published the edict of the Father on the cross. There's reflections of Colossians right there. Oh, such great teaching. He draws himself down to death through life eternal, though life eternal clothes him. Having stripped himself of the perishable rags, he put on imperishability. You see what happens to him on the cross? What are the perishable rags? His body. His body, his humanness, yeah, his materiality. That's stripped from him on the cross. Yeah, so finally, once Jesus goes to the cross, now we can read that book and take it into ourselves. And we can become imperishable as well. The bottom bullet, um, ignorance and delusion. This one's kind of intriguing. Uh, describing the world. Thus they were ignorant of the Father, he being the one whom they did not see. Since it was terror and disturbance and instability and doubt and division, there were many illusions at work by means of these, and many empty fictions, as if they were sunk in sleep and found themselves in disturbing dreams. What he's suggesting is that everything you're experiencing in this world is all like a nightmare that you're going through. <coughs> Either there is a place to which they are fleeing, everybody in dreams like that, or without strength they come from having chased after others, or they are involved in striking blows, or they are receiving blows themselves, or they've fallen from high places, or they take off into the air, though they do not even have wings. Again, sometimes it's as if people were murdering them, though there is no one even pursuing them, or they themselves are killing their neighbors, for they have been stained with their blood. When those who are going through all these things wake up, they see nothing. They who were in the midst of all these disturbances, for they are nothing. Such is the way of those who have cast ignorance aside from them like sleep, not esteeming it as anything. What is he saying about everything you're experiencing in this world? It's all a dream. It's all a dream. It's not actually too different from, from some Indian, uh, India Indian thought. In, in Hinduism and Buddhism, that it's all, everything is illusion, um, that none of it is real. And once you wake up, once you come to know the truth and wake up, you realize it's all been just a bad dream. So, is he saying that? Uh, he understands ignorance, or that he is ignorant, or accepts that he's ignorant, or... That he's a writer? <laughs> he's, writer. No, he's no longer ignorant. Oh, he's no longer ignorant. He has awakened from his sleep. Yeah. This will be next Sunday's sermon, I thought I would. <laughs> I thought I'd give you a preview today. <coughs> Are you sleeping through my sermon? What do you see? At, uh, what do you see in this that rings true for you? Anything? We don't really know how ignorant we are. <laughs> true. That's true. That's yeah. true. There is a sense of that. If we could really see the truth as God sees it, how much more free would we be? How much less caught in all the junk we let ourselves get caught in if we could see from God's perspective? There is a piece of that. There's also the verse, but now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Yes. 
Now we see through a glass darkly, then face to face. What we see now is only partial. There's just enough contact with things that really are scripturally sound and that are true to life. That this is this this can be tantalizing stuff. And might even feed your faith, given given the right the right circumstances. And then there are other parts of it that are just a little troubling. Is God not the creator after all? What should I do with this body of mine? Is it something just to be gotten rid of? Or should I be caring for it? What should I do with you? Are you just a bad dream? <laughs> or am I actually put in relationship with you? And that's actually one of the one of the main things that happens with the Gnostic systems, is that um, is that when you take them at least at face value and follow where they go, my task is to discover through Jesus' revelation to discover who I really am, and more and more know the truth about myself and become free from the trammels of this world. Um, but there's nothing about you in this. Has anyone studied this from a, a sociological point of view, educated, uneducated, um, peasants? I would, I would think that this kind of philosophy would only begin to be understood by someone who is well educated. I think you're right. And would appeal to somebody well educated. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't see a peasant farmer. I, I think of my dad. You know, who was very earthy, very down to earth. Things needed to be done, and you did them. Uh, you did them as well as you could, as honestly as you could. I, I can't see peasants being caught up in this kind of philosophy at all. And of course, if it's the well educated people who are espousing this, uh, they have a claim to be elite, mm -hmm. they have a claim to leadership. And so I. It, Peasants get caught up at all and get just dragged along in this kind of Probably true. Yeah. I don't know whether anyone has done a full sociological study of this, but my, I think your your hunch is right. And that also that also means that this that a movement like this could never really have been the dominant Christian faith. It could never have become that because it's it, it is it's such a small group that it would appeal to. And that group doesn't, doesn't reproduce itself very well. And so here you've got the Orthodox Church, you've got the, the Christian message uh, embracing every last one of us broken people in the Gospel of Jesus. Um, that's got a very wide appeal to, to ordinary folks. Um, so it's kind of the deck was stacked already. Um, but because the ideas are tantalizing, though the movement can never kind of overcome, it never really disappears either. It just kind of goes underground and resurfaces again and again. <clears throat> We could, we could look at some, look at some more in here, and there's um, I will you know, I'll call your attention to just a couple things in the Gospel of Philip. We did look at the Gospel of Philip back on the 11th of October, so we've seen some of that already when we were especially when we were looking at Mary Magdalene. Um, <clears throat> but uh, bottom of page four, one of the themes in the Gospel of Philip. This is into the third century now. Um, some, the, the, a thought that the Christian faith is not really what you think it is. So here's part of that um, elitism within the church. Um, it's claiming to be Christian, but most of you out there who are ordinary Christians, you use the terms one way, but you don't really know the truth of what those terms mean. And so this, this quote, the names first bullet under Christian faith is not what you think it is. The names which are given to the worldly things contain a great occasion for error, for they twist our consideration from the right meaning to the wrong meaning, 
Whoever hears the word God does not know the right meaning, but the wrong meaning. It's the same with the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, life, light, resurrection, the church. Uh, folk, ordinary folk do not know the right meaning. Um, we can teach you what those words really mean. There's a higher level of understanding of what these things are all about. So you can talk that got the same language going on in the church, but ordinary Christians understand it one way, and the elite understand it another way. Um, the next bullet. They err who say the Lord first died and then he arose. Truth is, first he arose and then he died. If someone does not first achieve the resurrection, will he not die? What does he mean? Can you tell? What would it mean if Je that Jesus first arose before he died? Get a gig here first. I think in the usual spatial representation that would be down. I think what it's, good, what it's getting after is that the resurrection is a spiritual phenomenon. That Jesus first arose into full consciousness of who he is and that's his resurrection. And then he could go ahead and die to this world. And by the same token, that's what your resurrection is going to be. Very different look at resurrection. Uh, bottom bullet. The truth has, did not come naked into the world, but came in types and images. One will not receive the truth in any other way. I think that's actually true. As I look at the scripture, how is God going to get through to us ordinary human beings? Well, the only way God can do it is through one metaphor after another. Because we can't see the unvarnished truth of everything. We're limited. And so God has to... I'm like a shepherd. I'm like a rock. I'm like this. I'm like that. Um, I think there's something right about that, that God communicates to us through images metaphors, pictures, uh, over and over again in scripture. I think the Gnostics mean something a little different by that claim, however. Okay. Where we're going to go after this is, <clears throat> next, next week we're going to look at the Gospel of John. Of all of the, of the Gospels that we have in our Bible, the one that the Gnostics liked best was John. And we're going to look at that and see why and see how you can read John like a Gnostic. And then we'll also ask, does John give us anything to um, undercut that reading? Okay, that's next week. Then the two weeks after that, we're gonna move into one final um, writing that's in a way, one of the most interesting of all of them, the Gospel of Thomas. It's perhaps the earliest of all of these and has some possibility of having some actual words of Jesus in it, maybe. We'll have to debate that and see. Okay? Let's pray. Lord, you are greater than we can put into words, and so are all of your truth. It is all of your truth. Thank you that you walked who you are and lived it out for us on the cross in your love and in your resurrection. Keep working with our thinking, Lord, and our hearing and our seeing. Help us to see your face. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.